This is a panel on shared resources and we'll be discussing allocation of the natural commons, that's um, earth, air, fire, which is the minerals, and water. But we'll also be talking about what other resources are or should be in our community commons and how those should be allocated. My co-presenters are Kelly Snar, and Kelly is founding director of the Halifax Tool Library. She serves as the director for multiple other community organizations, and uh, she is pas passionate about social entrepreneurship and the sharing economy. Derek Gillitz, Derek is director of Community Transit Nova Scotia, which works on challenges to and solutions for community transportation systems and is involved in multiple other projects around transportation issues. Francis is, um, started Hub Annapolis Valley in fall of 2012 as a rural co-working site and through that learned what works and what does not and is now exploring best models for such, such hubs and um, we'll give you examples of that. She is a director of Kentville Development Corporation and other community groups. Um, she recognizes that libraries are also community hubs and is passionate about mobilizing those resources. I'm Susan Witt. I'm executive director of the Schumacher Center for New Economics uh, for the past 35 years. Um, I'm also founder and a leaseholder of the Community Land Trust in the Southern Berkshires, and I'll be telling you about that model. Um, I also have a tremor. So my hand shakes, my voice shakes. I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> I could take medication, but there are side effects, so I choose not to. So please uh, be gentle with me and understand the, the tremor. The question, as Amy knows, of um, how to allocate the commons has long been a subject of economists, one that's debated back and forth. In a capitalist system, um, land and other natural resources are common inheritance, are commodified and sold to the highest bidder. Those who own the lands benefit from all of us needing to use the land. Henry George, the American economist and politician, would call that unearned increment. It's not true new economic value. It's based on scarcity. And it's one of the key reasons for some of the great inequities we have in our economic system, this commodification of the commons. Again, age-old concern of economists. In a socialist system, um, the land is, and the means of production are owned by the state. So the state is both <coughs> the holder of the land and the manager of the enterprises on the land. There are two 
completely different skills and activities in the economic, and it creates great inefficiencies and problems when that occurs. In um, a new economy approach to Commons tenure and allocation, you'll find community-based solutions rather than state or market. Community-based, volunteer, citizen-driven, and uh, systems that separate land tenure from the production on the land. Bob Swan was founder of the Schumacher Center for New Economics um, back in 1980. He was also a personal friend of Fritz Schumacher, who wrote Small is Beautiful mm. Economics as if people mattered. But he was also a CEO during World War II. He spent two and a half years in a federal prison because he didn't choose to be conscripted to go and fight. And there he had a lot of time to think about what are the root causes of war. And he came out of prison um, convinced to spend his life dedicated to work towards a new economic system, one that didn't have conflict at its roots. He also had to live, earn a living right away, hadn't gone to college, became a carpenter, um, was very active in the civil rights movement as well as the peace movement. And so he was often called by these groups when uh, a carpenter was needed. And one of those occasions was the burning of the black churches in the South in the 60s. And they called Bob down to lead black white crews in the rebuilding of those churches. And there he met Slater King, um, the cousin of Martin Luther King. And through Slater King, he learned of the trouble that African-American farmers especially were having in gaining access to land, thereby forcing them into the urban areas, into the conflicts and troubles of the urban area. So with Slater King, Bob began looking for a new system of land tenure through which African Americans to begin with could hold land and use it productively. And in that search, Bob met Vinaba Babe, who was um, the great spiritual successor, as it were, to Gandhi, great revered leader in India. And Vinaba was concerned about inequity of land ownership in the villages in India. And so he, with a group, would walk from village to village. And as they walked, they'd carry with them a Gandhian spinning wheel, because Gandhians don't misuse their time. So they'd sit there spinning as they gathered the village around them. And then about would say, you, my brothers and sisters, who have more land than you need, won't you give my brothers and sisters who have no land, land so they can begin to work the fields themselves? And out of great respect for Vinaba, those with more land than they needed turned over the deeds to Vinaba. And he then reassigned them to those without land. It was known as the Bhutan movement, the land gift movement. But after a while, Vinaba realized that those who now had land didn't have money to buy tools to work the land. 
and they were just reselling the land back to the wealthy. And so it hadn't worked. And then they were sent into the cities. I mean, they had no choice. So Vinaba changed the Budan movement to the Gramdan movement, the village gift movement. And the land, instead of individual deeds, was given to the village. And the village then assigned use rights, secure use rights, to the land as long as people were working it. If they gave up the working, then it reverted to the village who could reassign it. So Bob and Cider King saw this model. And out of it, they formed the Community Land Trust Movement. The first Community Land Trust was in Albany, Georgia. It was a 5,000 acre piece called New Communities, um, which was to be worked by the African-American farmers that had gathered together for this initiative. And the way the community land trust was structured, Bob felt it was appropriate. If you're going to think through a new land tenure system, who appropriately should be holding that land? He felt it should be place-based nonprofit organizations with open membership. Anyone in the region could become a member. But he wanted democratic structures so there was an accountability back to the community. He also had seen many intentional communities where the boards were made up only of the people using the land, and then second, third generation, we all sat around together and said, hmm, this land has gone up in value. If we just change the rules since we're the board, we can make a lot of money. And that land that was put into an intentional purpose was again out on the market. So Bob structured the community land trust. One third of the board was selected from the general membership. One third was selected from leasing members, from those actually on the land. They had fair representation, but not dominant representation. And the other third were appointed from the professional community. Um, lawyers, bankers, engineers, people who actually knew how to deal with land issues. So you had the broader community represented, those actually using the land represented, and um, the professional community. And then the community land trusts acquired land by gift or purchase, created a land use plan that reflected first the ecological conditions of the land, what could it bear, but then the needs of the community. So in our region, the need is um, for workforce housing. We're in a fourth home community. Forget just second homes. These are people with fourth homes, and they're there maybe seven weekends a year, and pushing the price of land up for local people. So in the community land trust in the Southern Berkshires, one of the requirements of our leasehold is year-round occupancy, right? And that it's your primary home, not your second, third, fourth home, all right? But um, the community land trust, then, uh, the lease gives ownership of improvements to the leaseholder, not the land. It's a 99-year lease. And those who lease 
own their improvements, their homes, the fences, the wells, the roads, um, not the land value, but the building itself. And should you want to sell, you must sell back to the community land trust at no more than replacement value adjusted for deterioration. Can anyone translate that? What does that mean? Replacement value adjusted for deterioration. What are people going to get back? Exactly. What it's going to cost them to build the same home somewhere else, but not the land value, right? So you get a rise that's equal to the rise in building costs, material costs, labor costs, but not land costs. So you keep up with the real economy, not that speculative economy, right? So a good deal, a fair deal. Um, and it takes the land out of the market forever. And it's bankable. We've got banks giving mortgages on leased land. I just talked with Eric Christmas about the Micmac nations and how it's so difficult for them to get individual mortgages. We've achieved that through the lease agreements. Um, but the lease isn't good just for homes. So Indian Line Farm, the first CSA farm in the U.S., is just down the street from the Schumacher's Library. It came up for sale when its farmer owner died, died tragically of an asthma attack. I'd say she died of poverty. She didn't have health care. If she were in Canada, she'd still be alive. Um, and again, we're in a fourth home community. What would have happened to that farm? Oh, fourth homer would have bought the land, taken down the house, it was an old farmhouse, taken down the house, built a McMansion, gone. You know, gone. Um, the Nature Conservancy owned the abutting wetlands. They approached the community land trusts and said, we want to keep that farming. We don't want a big McMansion there. Um, let's get together and make this happen. So donors, in, interested individuals in the community, and I'm talking about a lot of $25. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a big initiative. Raise the cost of the land. It was donated. The Nature Conservancy paid for the conservation easement. And then two farmers, two young farmers who'd never borrowed before, got a mortgage to buy the buildings. They weren't burdened with the debt on the land. They could start their business without that high debt on the land. Their CSA could pay their salary, their business costs, and the mortgage on the house, but I wouldn't have um, done the mortgage on the land. So, you know, real successful. Um, the lease is a contract, it can be very flexible. So the Nature Conservancy said, well, you know, the wetlands, we don't want any um, manure getting into that wetland, so no animals. The farmers went, wait a minute, we're organic farmers, we need to improve the soil. Manure is the best source for improving the best source of the manure is on site. Nature Conservancy said, oh yeah, I get it, you know, we get this. Um, how about two heifers? And then we'll see how it works out and we'll adjust later. Community land trust went, wait a minute, we don't want to change or uh, manage a revolving lease term, ever changing. We want to know what we're managing. We want the farmers to be able to know what we're, they're managing. So we came up with poundage of animals. 
two heifers, a big uh, pig, uh, uh, some sheep, a lot of chickens. You know, but the ground rules were there, right? You can see how it works. Again, flexible contract. I mean, um, we spoke with one kind of posh Connecticut town that wanted to do it, and they said, but the house kind of has to fit in our neighborhood. I mean, this is my mass prejudice over Connecticut showing. And I go, oh, oh yes, you can do that. You can put in the lease that the house has to be painted every three years to match your community standards. You might not get a farmer who will take it up, but at least that farmer will know what's required beforehand, correct? So, um, but it's not just housing, it's not just farmland. And again, these are all citizen initiatives, not government. Community land houses had no government funding. But here you have a community, you're thinking through the future of your community. You want to do more production in, the, in these rural areas. How are you going to achieve it? Well, you've identified a great <clears throat> business might be um, a canning facility. There are apples, you know, let's process them here. Um, don't the Micmacs have strawberry rhubarb pies? Mm. But, um, you know, I'm, the possibilities are out there. And, uh, but the cost of the land is a cost that keeps the enterprise from starting. So the community as a whole could say, We're, we've identified a site. We're purchasing it through our community land trust, and we'll lease it to you, at, you as a cooperative, or you as a partnership, or you as a mom and pop operation, if you um, make it a canning facility. And here are our conditions. Voila. You know, a start of the community supporting industry in that region. So. Um, a very flexible tool once you have it. Um, and even goes beyond the commons, as we'll hear from our other presenters, goes beyond just land and natural resources, right? I mean, first think, how do we deal with this extraordinary natural commons? But one of the Schumacher Center's board members is concerned about affordable performing spaces for the arts. He's seen that communities are more vibrant when there are new young artists active, creating plays, creating music, creating exhibits, um, and yet they need affordable space to perform. So he said, I want to put into the commons not just the land, but the buildings, the performance spaces, and have the community purchase that and then lease it on affordable basis, make available to new groups. So the possibilities are up to you to imagine your commons, your resources, and then how to hold it in trust for future generations and allocate it properly. But um, Kelly, do tell us about uh, tool libraries and how they can be a resource and how, um, how it works. Thanks, Susan. First slides is a is a video. It's a black slide. You just click back two. And um, my name is Kelly Snare. Um, I'm a literacy teacher for newcomers. I'm a program coordinator with the Sierra Club Atlantic, and I'm a director with the Tool Library. So this, I'm just going to show you a short crowdfunding video that we use to pitch the idea. Is there a place to turn it on? You just click it. 
The Halifax Tool Library. <laughs> I think of like a big room that's full of all kinds of crazy tools. Like a huge Kent. And it's probably a little bit, smells a little bit like grease, but there's a bunch of cool people around. A library is a source of books and everything, yep. so I would assume a library would be a source of tools. That's what I think of. <laughs> it, <laughs> it sounds weird, but is this possible? probably along the lines of, say, a co-op. So everybody has a membership, uh, you pay into a little bit, so that would just take care of the maintenance and upkeep and the tools of them themselves. I feel like the idea of having a tool library and having tool rentals is a really, really good idea. Like, I can share with my friends, so why not share with the entire community? I think that's one of the beauties of a library, is like, I want to read this book, but when I'm done with it, I'm not going to need it anymore. I could see people, like, willing their old tools to the tool library. You know, old guys and old ladies have got these crazy workshops full of stuff. I think it would be great if they could just be like, oh look, a bunch of people want to put this to good use. Here's all our stuff, use it. I'm just glad we didn't have to deal with it. My dream for a Halifax Tool Library would be a 24-hour workspace where people can go and at any time of the day learn and, and, and borrow. You go out and buy something cheap because it looks all right mm. and it's not so great when you get it home, whereas if you had the right tools, maybe you would have even considered building it yourself. Mm. No. My ideal tool library would be an environment where I could walk in, I'd have instructors on hand. so. Even if there's a tool I wasn't comfortable with, I have somebody there that can use it and has used it multiple times, and they're not worried about using it. And they're not worried about teaching me how to use it. You know, the economy is tightening up, and people are um, and people are resourceful. And if there are resources there that they can uh, lean on to use, they'll do more on their own. It helps people access stuff that they might not otherwise have access to if they're not individually wealthy. For the amount of money that I would spend in a year, on buying tools that I'm only going to use once or twice. I think it's better if I just go and, and pay the membership fee. I'm definitely going to get my money's worth. And it's going to encourage me as well, because once I put that money down, I'm going to make sure I build everything I want to build. As a nonprofit association, the Halifax Tool Library can help foster the sharing resource economy, which promotes learning and builds a new market where we don't have to buy things only to use it a few times. As a Tool Library volunteer, you can really make things happen. You can share your favorite skills and do amazing things with others. If you've only just heard, there's this community tool thing where everyone can borrow, lend, and learn as a member of the library. Just remember why as kids, we all like to do stuff. Rather than own things. Which just ended up in the corner of the basement anyways. This is the place we all can use, full of tools to make and do. So I, I can use the, the, the mouse now. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that was our crowdfunding video. Um, we put it online and, you know, with with that simple story and a simple ask, um, we had some incentives, but we raised 120% of what we asked for. And that was our annual budget. Um, so we got a really great brand to start. We uh, utilized the expertise in the community. We have a really great art university. And so designing this logo and then animating it in the movie, um, it took about 200 hours to, to totally storyboard and film that. So. Um, nobody was paid to do it. We all wanted to. We were all really excited about the idea and making the community learn about it. So um, since, since opening, we've partnered with a Bicycle Cooperative. Um, we're a membership-based organization with the board of directors um, who holds liability insurance. And so I'm just going to take you through, through the process. Um, it's not an original idea. There's, it's the 40th in North America. Um, but an, a new kind of concept might be a street bank. And so this is kind of, when you want to think about a tool library, it, this is a location-specific um, sharing platform 
So it's similar to Kijiji, but what you would like to give and what you'd like to get can be, can be located according to where you are, and it's very user-based. So you, you basically have to share, to, you have to jump online, share, and then tell your friends about it, and they can jump online as well. So it's pretty novel. It's in its beta stages, um, but it's, it's great. So what we did um, 16, a year and a half ago, uh, we, t we built this little red toolbox that could, and we dragged it around town, and we engaged about 1,000 people. Um, we shared our values, and we asked people what they wanted, what, what they hoped for. Um, and so we explained that the tool library could be somewhere that we were going to build a community that was based on um, building community instead of waste, um, not buying something just to use it once, and sharing ideas and skills. And what we really did was we had a business model. And we, through that community engagement, we were able to ask some very specific questions about what, what people wanted. And we wanted to connect their needs to common resources. So we asked a bunch of questions, and we got some very specific answers about how much they wanted to pay for a membership, where it should be, how they would be using the space. And through that, we were able to really identify where and when and, and how much. So we had a tool drive alongside a crowdfunding campaign. And we collected 500 hand tools and power tools. And we, we as uh, five really committed board members, and myself being, being the only girl, I stuck around. Um, we put in countless volunteer hours. And um, this awareness and solid messaging, I really think, um, built on our credibility. A lot of people found out about us through the local newspaper or business cards at cafes. Um, but the, the outreach that we did with the little red toolbox that could was, was everywhere. We went on the streets. Um, to churches, to markets, and, and stop people in their tracks and saw that little light bulb come on and a tool library, what, what? So the idea that it could be and still could be um, anything you want it to be. You can bring your ideas to the space and, and share them. So one thing we do have on our site is technology. Um, Local Tools is a website you can go to, anybody can. And um, it's online cataloging, and you use uh, your feedback as payment. So you're, you're improving the platform. So basically, it's online inventory. Um, you have really easy, you've, you've got a um, really easy registration process. So your front desk volunteer doesn't have to sweat it too much. Um, but in addition to local tools, we have a full social media platform a really great phone number, um, and a dynamic website that people can, can check out. So one of the, the key successes, I think, was the partnerships that we made and the networking that we did throughout those engagements and really leveraging what Halifax is good at. I think a lot of things are going on, and um, there, there are people that, that supported us early on. Toronto is opening up its third library at the end of the month connecting through the public library system. So the tool library and the public library are now one thing. So you know, they're, they're reaching for the stars and they're, they're really, really getting them. So mentoring um, was, was important from the Toronto Library, but early adopters and early supporters like Fusion Halifax, the Ecology Action Center, the Furniture Bank, Building Supply Partners, um, really helped uh, establish what was already going on, not reinventing the wheel. And so we've been open six months. We've had our doors open for six months, and we've already been able to mentor three other tool libraries around the country in terms of getting off the ground, building momentum, and, and keeping it going. And so I think Hamilton right now is doing a crowdfunding campaign. So it's that cross-platform advantage that's, that's really great. Um, that we believed in the idea of the sharing resource economy and that you're, you're going to spend your energy. The, the essence of the tool library is you're spending your energy learning and sharing and doing. So make, 
paws do. And you're not spending all of your efforts acquiring, right? Going to the store, making sure you get that one thing you need just to use it one time. So we have a community group connection. We're hoping to further get these resources to a low income target. Right now with our messaging, I, I don't think we're as successful as we want to be. So, so building on that is, is one thing we will be doing. But just to know that we're not doing it alone, um, what already works, and, and really empowering our members to make sure that they, they are feeling like the resource of the, of the tool library, that they're able to share things that, or ask things, ask for things. So that's our website. We've got ladies night on Tuesdays, uh, everybody night on Wednesday, and uh, Saturday morning for, for families. And you can go in and uh, become a member by, by volunteering or paying 35 to 50 bucks for an annual membership. And you've got access to a really cool selection of, of tools. So some of the take homes. What's missing in your neighborhood? Um, is it a tool library that's needed? So making it really local and really specific to your area might be an important part of, of building up what is your tool library. Um, some identification of you know, rural outreach, not just on the peninsula of Halifax, but having a trail building sharing satellite shed. Does that appeal to you in your area? Um, does a community core of passionate folks building under funded community buildings, fixing ramps, and uh, just th those ideas, the, the tools can be used in, in whatever capacity um, possible. The sky's the limit, really. Um, and so how about a shared workshop or a lab or a space, like a makerspace? They've partnered in Toronto with the makerspace and the 3D print lab, so lots of, lots of possibilities for sure. But one thing you do want to remember with the tool library is that that, that constant membership ask and celebration of, of the t using the tools. So we have gift certificates available if anybody would like to um, give a gift to your family member in the HRM. They're available. Okay. <laughs> Derek is especially working with underutilized public resources and how to make those active. Derek. Thank you. Just ring the bell and get started here. Uh, I'm just going to bring up my slide deck. Oh, right. Thank you. Uh, I'll be the no. No, transportation vision, practice, action. It's in the stack of, yeah, there it is. So I'm Derek and uh, I've been passionately involved in transportation issues for some time. And uh, to begin, I'd just like to give a bit of background of what kind of brought me into a transportation bubble that I'll probably choose to stay in for my lifetime. Um, I've worked as a counselor uh, at group homes for people uh, with special needs, and that's where I first became most like uh, uh, especially um, sensitive, I guess, to transportation issues in communities, um, because the uh, groups of people and individuals that I was assisting on a daily basis certainly had, uh, I guess, limited opportunities in terms of access to their community and even visibility uh, as an individual in the community. Um, so that's where I, uh, I worked for 10 years um, before getting more deep deeper into transportation specifically. Um, but that really opened my eyes to a lot of things and also started uh, to uh, appreciate, I guess, the history of uh, where we've been, where we're at, where we're going as uh, communities, as uh, collective individuals in our life experience. Um, and that became heightened, uh, my passion for transportation issues over time, since ever since. Um, since then, I worked uh, in environmental nonprofit organizations, uh, around uh, looking at transportation efficiency. Um, I'm now a board member of Community Transit Nova Scotia, and our uh, vision and mission is to uh, help support uh, Nova Scotians and everyone that they have access to safe and affordable transportation options. 
um, everywhere in Nova Scotia. <clears throat> and at the moment, I work in Halifax at CarShare HFX uh, as a fleet support person. So I'm like making sure the cars are running nice and all of that and uh, massaging vehicles and things and keeping members happy and all of that and doing a lot of logistics planning and stuff. Um, I uh, also worked with on fleet management issues, looking at fuel efficiency, engine technologies, drive wiser with Clean Foundation, um, which educates everyday drivers and commuters about uh, efficient driving habits and how that translates into safe driving habits and also opportunities to drive less uh, and explore active transportation and other active ways to engage with your community. So anyway, uh, that's a bit of a splash introduction there. So basically, I'm open to any kind of question or interest that you may have around transportation. And chances are I have some kind of idea or information or referral that I can put to you. Uh, I also wrote my email address down on the paper in one of the discussion topic rooms. So if you'd like to email me at any time, go ahead uh, and we'll get started. So this image here, uh, I think, says a lot. Um, and basically what I would like people to kind of remember or appreciate is that, you know, as people, as beings, we're all born with inherent dignity. And we're all deserving of life circumstances to enact that dignity. And I became an even deeper appreciator again. Things keep uh, uh, escalating for me personally, I guess, on my quest with this transportation problem. Uh, when I uh, was involved in a motor vehicle accident. I was on a bicycle and I lost to a motor vehicle and I hit the pavement pretty hard. And I was lucky, I survived. And uh, our emergency response personnel were amazing. Surgery was successful, et cetera, et cetera. But as soon as I hit that pavement that morning, I instantly had this like deeper appreciation and understanding or totality of kind of an awareness, a deeper awareness around transportation issues and. And, and this whole idea that really transportation is about human dignity and how we, our built environment needs some uh, adjustments. Um, how do I click a slide? I've been having trouble since last time too. That's great. So uh, where we are today come, comes a lot from where we were yesterday and our collective uh, uh, ingenuity, innovations, stuff like that. Some things were invented and took off, other things were invented and didn't take off or maybe were you know, made to not take off. Uh, and so we've come a long way. And this is a, a bit of an exaggeration, I guess, when you think about rural context, but uh, a lot of things center around the automobile and I think all of us can appreciate that. Um, and we're all in a rush these days and because of our uh, you know, growth in the automobile industry and reliance on automobiles for a lot of things, you know, we've put things farther away from each other and our communities. We have to go farther to get food. It's probably rare for a lot of people to be able to access food without having to access some kind of an automotive, right? How can we change that? So here we are in Annapolis Royal, and I put this slide in, and then I was like, wow, I should just put pictures of spring in for like the entire <laughs> presentation. Because I, I, I can even just feel the image like it's uh, it, it absorbing uh, something I need right now. Uh, go on. So uh, on my quest of learning and, and trying to tackle some important issues in my sphere, uh, I've noticed many signs. And being kind is more important than being right is a big one when it comes to uh, our collective efforts to try and solve some transportation problems, some big ones, uh, especially in rural and remote communities. Uh, but the, the good news is that we have an opportunity every single day to put a dent in that day, right? And every single day we have an opportunity to think outside the box. Explore life outside the box, whether that box is a car or a bus or a train or a house, uh, you know, a building is a box. Uh, but yeah, let's think outside of the box. Let's like start to look at our built environment and notice things maybe that have always been under our noses, but maybe turn on some lights and put our heads together, 
perfect switch. <laughs> Put our heads together and, and work together and strategize and, and really kind of, you know, asset map our community. Really explore what assets do we have? What are we underutilizing? You know, what's been here all along that we could be using more to our advantage and help connect people to where they need to go and, and places and, you know, goods, etc. <clears throat> So another sign that I came to along the way was, you know, understanding that the road to success is always under construction. So there's always work to do toward this amazing movement, this amazing goal, you know, and when you get the right outlook or the right mind frame, it's actually like a, a, an energy source in itself. I'm never going to stop working on this stuff, and I'm pretty happy about that. And uh, I'd like more people to work with me on these things. So the road to success is always under construction. Maybe in some cases, that road to success is literally under construction. Maybe there's signs popping up all around us, right? We're all on the journey of learning. That's painted on the side of many school buses. Buses, just buses that are painted yellow. We call them school buses. And there's like at least 1,300 of them everywhere in Nova Scotia, rural, remote, urban. We have at least 1,300 extra buses. So uh, recently I was involved in a project with uh, Schoolhouse Consulting and their mandate, we met at a conference much like this actually, Dr. Bennett and I. And uh, it was a one Nova Scotia Ivany report engagement session or whatever. And we connected, and he re he's really passionate about preserving, you know, small community schools and other things around, you know, education uh, and making that better. And then I was already super pumped about transportation, and I was like, hey, did you ever think about the whole school bus thing? Mm -hmm. And that was when lights came on for both of us, and we were like, wow, this is like a partnership that we need to pursue and a project that we should do. So we did, and we got in with the Atlantic Institute for Market Studies, and recently in January published a report called Education on Wheels. And basically what, we're, what we've started is investigating, you know, uh, school bus uh, industry or the growth of school busing in Atlantic Canada and what that means in terms of funds and mo public money through the Department of Education uh, and how that might be siphoning from classrooms and even community schools and going into bus services that at the moment are exclusive to little people but maybe someday we could expand or even consider actually can you go back to that bus for a second uh and, and something that i uh, uh i guess i'll share is that you know the report is is a is a research report and there's lots of data there um but really what i'm pumped about is considering how we might be able to rethink and adapt existing school bus resources to something that models and looks and feels more like a transit system and helps grow and support and pollinate a transit culture. So this bus is, looks, is shaped a bit more like a transit bus. That's a start. Maybe every single bus should be painted yellow. I don't know. Uh, this is a King's Transit bus, for instance. So King's Transit <clears throat> is, a, is a, one of the community uh, transit services in the local area, actually. If I would have planned ahead more or didn't have so many things on my list as fleet support person at CarShare, I would have liked to have tried to go maritime bus to Wolfville and then hop on King's Transit and come and share with you. Um, but next time, uh, I'll do that. So this, is a, this bus here is slightly smaller than the standard size bus. So this is just an idea, uh, an example of tools that are evolving and even built locally. So this is a can Canada-made bus. Um, it's shorter than, than the usual transit bus. So it's able to probably uh, maneuver through some smaller, tighter streets and turn around in more places and stuff than some of the big ones, right? That may or may not be able to connect with some of the uh, housing properties and places uh, in rural communities particularly that probably are some of the most loyal customers to transit services. Uh, of course, there's also yeah. vans uh, and things. And this here is, uh, uh, I, I kind of borrowed this from uh, Transport de Claire, another community transit service in the area that services Digby and many other areas. Uh, and similarly, King's Transit, as people likely know, services a huge area in Nova Scotia. It's amazing. Um, but there's still ways that we can make this better. And by right-sizing fleets and looking at various size vehicles, vans, 
wheelchair accessibility, et cetera, we can hopefully have a, a better system over time. Uh, Community Transit Nova Scotia in 2012 published a discussion document that helps uh, uh, feed a lot of the language that uh, people may need in, uh, in their own neck of the woods to help advance community transit uh, opportunities and or business opportunities. So this is a document that's available on the Community Transit Nova Scotia <coughs> website. And it really uh, just is basically a collection of feedback from community members, particularly in rural Nova Scotia, uh, and also identifies uh, many uh, parts of uh, all levels of government uh, mandates and such that pretty much all uh, admit that transportation is such an important issue um, that it, it, it must be included uh, as some sort of public service in order for so many other government mandates to be effective, like community services, health, uh, tourism, you name it. Um, so some of that language and some of those informations could help in making business proposals, things like that. Um, Another thing that I'd like to just spell out is that, you know, we have opportunities to notice uh, a lot of things in our communities that maybe could be tweaked or changed simply and how we can all work together. One thing that I'd like to highlight, uh, and this comes from a project that I was involved with on uh, with GPI Atlantic, Genuine Progress Index Atlantic, uh, recently uh, did a project, a youth-led project called Youth Ride Research and Action Project. And so this is a map that was generated from uh, feedback from uh, youth participants that uh, would like to have better transportation options in their community, particularly St. Margaret's Bay area, Chester, et cetera. Uh, and so this is just highlighting some of the pick up, drop off points that they'd like to see happen someday um, without the need to own a car, um, whether that's buses, vans, shuttles, ride share, car share, whatever. This kind of information is very important um, for a significant portion of the population. Um, so I would encourage you, if you're going to explore any opportunities to advance transit culture, uh, that you must connect and get feedback directly from young people. And uh, <clears throat> this slide here just uh, highlights uh, and basically where we're at now with telecommunications. We have more opportunities and tools than ever to better use our wheeling resources and connect them with people and places and time and space and all of that. And uh, you can advance. Um, we're just gonna click through right fast now. I just got a few items. Uh, so car sharing is possible, ride sharing. Uh, just slow down just a little bit. <laughs> then we can like right size <laughs> fleets. Uh, oh, sorry, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, we're getting, getting into hybrid and electric technologies and we want to put more renewable energy into the grid. And then, you know, if we can bridge the uh, renewable energy grid with our transportation modes and vehicles and understand that when we choose to get on that bus or get on in that car or do that ride share that this vehicle is powered by the wind, you know, at our back, that'll be an amazing day. And we'll be able to understand our transportation and our consumption choices using a similar language. Um, the power that, that heats our, our lights and, or does our lights and stuff will eventually someday be the same power that helps deliver the good or get you to, you know, entertainment or uh, connect with family. Uh, bicycles are a huge opportunity. Active transportation, trails, pathways, you name it. What, what uh, paint can do. Uh, the other thing I'd encourage people to consider is how can we make more people notice that these things are important, you know? So this is an example of bike valet. So uh, if you have an event or something going on, you know, put some bike parking out, but yeah, roll out a red carpet, have like a gesture, uh, a welcoming gesture added in there and up the uh, profile of that event or let people know that you appreciate that they're choosing to walk or bike to the market or to the movies or whatever it is. Um, signage, get creative with the signage. This is all about saying, you know, people walk here. This is from Panama. I saw that and I was just like, that's awesome. Right? <laughs> people run. <laughs> uh, there's a lot you can do with paint click thanks yeah so in Halifax there's been placemaking projects going on uh, and uh, switch open street Sunday so this is a huge one that I'm a big fan of volunteer with uh, and really when you open up street spaces particularly on Sundays for people to come out and get on 
and, and enjoy in so many creative ways and get community together, it really helps more and more people notice and look at the built environment in a new way and start to explore ways that you know, we could consider using our street spaces and our public pavement uh, in, in better ways. Uh, ex celebrating Car Free Day, uh, getting out there and, and you know, uh, voting with your feet or on your uh, pedals or whatever the case may be. Um, parking Day is another day where uh, it's an international thing where people uh, get out and do creative things in parking spaces and make them more like a park uh, for, for a couple hours. Um, yeah, streets can be for people sometimes. We don't always have to be waiting for the traffic lights to change and stuff like that. Uh, we have 24 hours in a day. We have places that we know people go. We got hubs we want to develop um, and places where people are going to be in the daytime and nighttime. And how can we help them transform and improve our lives? Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> um, this is a, a, just to tell you a little bit about me and that I'm a gatherer of people and ideas and a connector of ideas and people. Um, we, um, so three years ago, a few of us got together and decided we wanted to open a hub in our community. September of that year, we got the word that there was a space for us. Uh, we had two weeks, <laughs> and we were in there, this huge space um, with not too much rent. It was a three-month project. We gave it a whirl, and then, um, as you can see, we had TEDx Nova Scotia in there. We had uh, Kenful Development Corporation had a... Um, uh, strategy session. We had a bunch of people with support from our community. Then the three months ended and they wanted their space back. <laughs> so that was the end of that one for that. For that. Um, but being a business strategist and passionate about this, I decided to take everything I learned and uh, figure out how to do this better. I reached out to other co-working spaces around the world to find out how they're doing it. So I researched um, best practices, exploring models, and found inspiring stories. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, community hubs, what they are. We're going to talk a little bit about rural, and we're going to talk about um, hub models and how you can do it in your community. Okay, so as long as we've had communities, we've had community hubs. We are a social species. All through the ages, we've been getting together for everything from spreading ideas, research, commerce, trading goods, um, business, culture, mutual support, and um, promotion. In Nova Scotia, we've had a tradition of this. Did you know that Einstein came to Nova Scotia and had uh, talks, Linus Pauling as well at the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. That's so cool. <laughs> Bit of a science geek here, so that's like... <laughs> <laughs> um, the Order of Good Cheer, just down the road here, is one of the first social clubs in all of North America. We've been gathering and having fun for a long time. We st the Antigonish Movement, which is a cooperative movement, we've been doing this. So what are hubs today? Um, they're co-working spaces, community centers, cafes, places of gathering and distributing food, markets, launch pads, sandboxes, innovation centers, libraries, maker spaces, tool libraries, um, gardens, pop-ups, events, fairs, festivals, these are things that we've been doing all along. Oh, I had to press. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about rural. One of the things we know about rural people is that we tend to be a little bit introverted. We just want to go home, be alone. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we know is that they're, we're slightly older. Um, we tend to be a little bit more conservative. And one of the awesome things about being in a rural area is that when you leave the house, you always run into people you know. And it's also one of those things that you don't want sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but what that does is it gives you sort of this fishbowl effect. You have this feeling that whatever you're doing, people are watching you, and they are. <laughs> <laughs> 
but one thing we did find out, especially when we opened our hub for a while, is that space is not an issue. Most people in a rural area have plenty of space. They like to work from home. We're not in Amsterdam in a 250 square foot apartment that we're sharing with three other people. The other thing that we know is that in rural areas, we do have a sense of community already. If you're a young person just moving into a city, you would crave that sense of community, and a hub could be that for you. We don't have that as much in a rural area, although we do love to get together and talk about the things that we're passionate about. Sometimes it just makes it a little more difficult to get rural people to come where you are. So that's something we keep in mind. So we're going to talk about some of the business models here. Um, this is the founder model is one of the more successful ones. Um, and as I'm talking about business models, let me make it very clear that there's no such thing as only one. Most community hubs use a whole number of different ones. So you can see the South Shore guys there. Um, they started with three people who needed a place to work, so they got their own place to work and then opened it up and let other people come in. They were fully prepared to carry it on their own. Um, after a year or two, they now have a waiting list and have moved into a much bigger space. So there's another little piece there, listen to your members. They will tell you what they want and grow appropriately. Member and user fees. Um, it, that works especially in co-working places, um, the space in Shelburne. Um, it, and it's also around events and programming can also be a way to supplement that. Um, actively grow. So in order to get members to come to your place, you have to actively get out there and, and invite them in. Uh, events and programming is one way to do it, but the ones that are working really well go out, they identify the people they want, and they say, come on. <laughs> and they bring people in. Um, one thing we do know is a membership based only, if that's the only thing, it won't work. That, that it's, it just it doesn't make enough money. Nobody is making enough money in that model anywhere in the world that I know of. Here's another model, community funded. Farmworks, the darling of our conference here, and for good reason. <laughs> Uh, New Dawn, as well as the CDF, and they bought the Holy Cross, um, oh, I can't forget it. Anyway, big building, <laughs> put a whole bunch of things in it. Uh, and those are, both of those are community economic development investment funds, community funded. Partnerships and sponsorships, of course. Um, Halifax Makerspace is working with a uh, business in Halifax who has given them space. That works awesome. Volta Labs, um, that's a combination there. That's a founder based, as well as they got some good uh, sponsorships from a couple of professional companies in Halifax to help build the infrastructure. And then events, of course, always often have um, sponsorships, and that works really well. And then, of course, the other thing you can do is um, actually have a business in your community hub such as the Wolfers, Wolfville Farmers Market there. Um, the Port Grocer is doing a really good job with that. They're doing um, some pretty cool things um, with uh, a grocery, a uh, cafe, their, their mail station as well. And they might even get some liquor license, which really would make them a community hub. <laughs> <laughs> but those are just different ways that you can do, um, do that. Um, so and then to talk a little bit about ownership, there's a debate there about should this be nonprofit, cooperative, or privately owned, and everything in between. And it, all of those things are happening. Um, and it depends really upon the aims of the group and what you want to have happen. Um, yeah. So for co-working spaces, what has been found to work best is a private ownership, business for business. Um, but some of the other models work better as a nonprofit. Um, so, advice. Uh, I just took a, a hub road trip this week uh, to get the newest information, and I asked everybody, what's your advice? And this is what they came up with. You need a strong core group with a vision and balanced skills. That works best. 
the, um, the Hub South Shore really said that. You know, they've got three guys, all totally different. It's, it's hilarious. And, but they all have their piece, and they all do a great job with it. Start appropriately. Um, if you think that you can build it and they will come, um, it probably will work, but it's going to take way longer than you think it will. So you have to give yourself enough runway. You have to give yourself enough time to be able to build it or to be able to hold out until they all come. So it, makes, yeah. so it makes much more sense to build small and then grow as required. Um, talk to your members and listen to what they say, because they will tell you. And give them ownership. And that was one of the things I've seen that was a big difference between uh, community hubs that work really well and ones that are struggling, is that they've given their members ownership. So the members have some idea that they want to do, and the really open hubs will say, Go. Oh, that's awesome. What do you need? And let them do it. And it works. It just, that, that builds your community and um, it makes it more exciting and people want to be involved in that. Um, partnerships and sponsorships are, are vital. You have to have those partnerships. You have to have, um, work with other groups within your community. And then diversity in terms of the people that are involved, the things that you're doing, your business model, all of it. Just make it messy, but exciting, and um, it'll work best. So if you want a hub in your community, find the people in your community who are doing this and support them. And I can almost guarantee there are people in your community who are working on this. This is a thing whose time has come. Um, we, the um, Hub Annapolis Valley, when we started working on this three years ago, we reached out to Hub Halifax, and they put us in touch with Hub South Shore. Um, and we all got together and started working together and sharing best practices and ideas, and that worked really well. And we're very excited about it. And now that we hear so much about other people wanting to do hubs, we're hearing from them saying, can you help us? So we've decided to put together a summit in the fall. If you're interested, please give me your information and I'll put you on our list and we'll let you know. And so now I wanted to show you a little video. Oh, can you do that? That would be awesome. It's the, yeah. We'll yeah. see this one, right? Yes, I think. Yep. This is about growing a movement in your community and this will help you with any movement you want to start. So ladies and gentlemen, at TED we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> And here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so. Notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. So <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? 
is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first, and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> We have 15 minutes, and we would all love your questions. And uh, Sherry will be holding a mic for those that have questions. Hi, this question is for Francis. I'm from New Brunswick, and uh, we've heard a lot about your community hub model to save rural schools. Um, how does the rural school hub differ or is the same with the model you just described? Just take that. I'm, yeah. I'm going to hold it. You're not getting it, right? <laughs> just kidding. Um, I, I really don't know a lot about the rural school hub model, to tell you the truth. I'm coming from the co-working business side of it. Um, there are people here. Who are, who are involved in that. Um, so I, your best bet would actually be to go down to the table, the community hub table, and, and that's where people are hanging out and talking about that. Where is that? Um, downstairs way at the end. <laughs> Good luck. Now, yeah. Is there anybody in this room? Is, the community school hubs? They were all here this morning. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Um, I live in the Annapolis Valley here, and one of our biggest deterrents for people living not in the valley itself is we're 5,000 that don't even have internet at our place so far. So, like, even communicating with this conference was, you had to go to town to, to do it. So, um, I'm thinking also the same thing. Somewhere we need to start thinking of projects that we can start supporting ourselves. The town of Berwick has started producing an internet feed for anybody that's within the town. So if you don't want to have your own and accept the speed that it's going at, you don't even need to have a, an internet supplier. So I'm wondering why we're getting a New Brunswick company right now to do satellite for Nova Scotia so us in the valley can actually get reception. And, and so I'm wondering if the hub kind of solution is one of the ways we could go with one of these problems we're facing. It's like transportation, but at another level. It's like, and with transportation, at the same time, I'll bring those two things. I was in Jamaica, and they have a neat thing there, taxis. You fill the taxis until the taxi is full, and he goes along the road, drops you off. So he figures out, OK, what's the itinerary? Taxi takes off with seven people all squished, and by the time you're done, and it reduces the fare. So an idea, again, for city people, why do we have to be one person in a taxi or even in the country right now? Why are taxis just linear? So those were the two. Uh, so I'm wondering about, is there a way that you see a, how a hub or a, a group that could focus on something else outside of physical? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, sure. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I guess, and, and I think that's how it, it's going to have to happen, is that a group of people gets together, identifies a need, um, find, find that lone nut, and help them to do that. Are you sure? Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I think the, the hub theme is, is big um, for probably a lot of the subjects, topics discussed over the whole weekend. And I see the hub model being a major uh, asset to advancing transportation and, yeah, uh, utilities. You know, like uh, the examples that uh, 
um, Schumann mentioned in his keynote this morning uh, about developing small energy uh, businesses and stuff in uh, small towns. The same thing could be done, yeah, with uh, with internet utility. Um, and actually, uh, something that interesting that's happening now is meshing um, Wi-Fi and internet connectivity through the transportation network. So, you know, part of the incentive that's going to help more people uh, experience life out of behind the steering wheel will be uh, amenities like Wi-Fi and stuff on buses and transit systems. Um, and not only that, the actual network um, uh, integrity will be riding on the vehicles themselves, right? So then, you know, a car becomes an antenna, basically. Uh, and, and yeah, that leads to all sorts of interesting, flexible, adaptable abilities. Uh, I have a question for Derek. Uh, you talked about active transportation, and I was just kind of curious about uh, um, what would be the single biggest way that we can move from a car culture into an active uh, uh, transportation uh, culture? Uh, I would say one of the biggest things would be to, well, a couple things. I think it's mainly a land use issue, issue and how we're currently uh, deciding which properties are what function um, needs to drastically change um, and all sorts of uh, zoning regulations need to be adapted um, for all sorts of reasons uh, demographic and stuff like that and how many large houses we have in various places and whether or not they're even necessary for the next generation and stuff like that and whether they should be houses or you know transformed into some other interesting hub like space um, and that would bridge the current gap or the uh, the road lengths between those current buildings. Um, so that's something that'll take a while, but I, I guess what would be a, a faster solution um, would be, you know, keeping community schools in communities, um, maintaining and preserving uh, walkability and main streets. Um, I think that's what keeps towns like Wolfville, for instance, and Annapolis Royal and others flourishing is that Main Street uh, center, that hub that's there already, um, <laughs> versus some other places that may have already lost their community schools and now students are being conveyed on uh, yellow buses, of, you know, an hour to 90 minutes one way to a highway off ramp. Um, not only that, the rec centers that are being put in places and establishments like Access Nova Scotia, like government outlets, are often off highway ramps too. I think that should change. Uh, Good, thanks, David. And paint, paint. Oh. Yeah, the Blue Route <laughs> is, is a good thing for Nova Scotia. It's basically an integrated bicycle network that'll help connect uh, those hubs, those towns, those centers. Uh, I have two questions. So the first one is for Derek, and Derek, as briefly as you can. Uh, can you talk a, a bit about how we can do organized hitchhiking in the various forms, not just app based, but also traditional thumbs out with a sign, so it builds community trust? Yes. That's first question. Thanks, David. Yeah, that was something I, I definitely knew was a bit of a gap in the few minutes I had to try and talk about everything. Um, but yeah, that's that's I think a major thing. Like for the rural context, I've been trying to figure out, you know. How can car sharing work? You know, how can car share like member-based cooperatives work in a rural setting where you know uh, people live so dispersed in some cases? And how would they get to a car that's shared, and vice versa? So yeah, the hitchhiking. So a blend of like car sharing and ride sharing, and current smart devices and stuff like that are uh, are going to be helpful. But I also feel that even just like the tangible infrastructure that you don't necessarily have to have a smart device or a phone to use are okay, going to be important. Okay. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, well, I'm going to finish. <laughs> and uh, what I'd like to say is that in island communities, especially like uh, a gentleman mentioned about Jamaica there, they have like places where, you know, this the paved shoulder uh, is, has enough space for people to pull over. And that paved shoulder is with a different style of pavement or a different color. And if you're standing in that zone, 
the red zone is going to the airport, the green zone is going to the grocery store. You know what I mean? You don't even have to put your thumb up, you just stand there and the person passing by knows that, oh, I'm going to the grocery store too. I'm gonna to pull over in the green zone, they're gonna hop in and off we go. You know what I mean? But then there's also the advantage nowadays with the online uh, uh, environment to be able to track and put in those safety guards and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I've hitchhiked from Alaska to Costa Rica myself. Um, um, Susan, that's the question is, is to you, and uh, you know, I organized the Upskilling Festival, and on so many of these things we talked about, even makers, but not these upskillers of doing heritage skills. And um, outside the obvious, do you have any? Uh, uh, um, suddenly, suddenly, this is going wacky. It's feedback. I wasn't there a second ago. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but so, uh, in terms of the, the kind of heritage skills and, and the newer skills, that, that really wasn't addressed, and I think that it, it needs something because it's such a foundation of, of society and where we're going. Do you have any ideas there? I don't. Your suggestion speaks to it. Thank you, David. Um, so, adding skills to our community resource space. Yeah, right here. Uh, hi, my question's for Derek, and you just sort of briefly touched on it, but I was wondering if you did have any more thoughts or comments on starting a car share program in a rural community. Uh, yeah, um, so I work with car share Halifax, and they're on paper, I guess, uh, noted as car share Atlantic, so there is intention to expand outward to other parts of Nova Scotia and the Maritimes. And uh, I know conversations and meetings and things are happening in a lot of places. Um, in order for it to really touch down on the ground in, in a rural community, um, it'll have to, you know, there'll need to be a local champion, like a steward uh, or a team or a society or whatever the case may be, or a hub um, to, to, you know, take on some of that responsibility of, of planting the roots and growing the car share community. Um, but I also feel that there are some existing resources like school buses, for instance, there are also government fleet vehicles, um, like uh, building inspectors often use like station wagons and regular everyday cars to go around and do building inspections. And then those cars are often brought to some kind of lot and parked, or there's like a recreation van in, in your community somewhere that might be rusting out most of the time. Um, and those vehicles are there, and technically taxpayers own them. And maybe they could be eventually uh, rolled into some kind of car co-op type model where citizens could have access to use these vehicles under, you know, certain screening and stuff like that um, on evenings and weekends, for instance, you know, with proper checks and balances. Let's have one more question. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, so a question for you. I didn't see your whole presentation, but I uh, was fascinated with the idea of the land trust and uh, dealing with McMansions. Uh, I, uh, with some trepidation, uh, I have a second house, I admit to it, in, in public in uh, Nova Scotia. But it strikes me that um, Nova Scotia has thousands of fascinating people who come to Nova Scotia because they love it, either because they lived here once, usually, or they have relatives, and they come and spend as much time as they can, and uh, that the opportunity is that that's a natural resource. And rather than simply yep. treating it as something to be avoided, uh, it should be people that should be invited in because they, uh, they bring ideas and activity and uh, understandings from all over the world. So I'm just wondering if there's another approach as well to some of the, your thoughts there. Certainly. Our first 18-unit um, housing project that we did um, in order for the first time home buyers to get mortgages on lease land, which was then new, um, that was a challenge for the funding with the bank. So we reached out to the second home community and said, those of you with two homes, would you help um, those with no home yet get started? In 90 days, we raised 100,000 of second mortgage money, which allowed five people to go forward with the mortgage from the bank. And we do in the Berkshires treat our second home community as 
valued part of the community. They intend to retire there. They're supporting our local businesses. So they're not the enemy. It's just also a reality that housing prices go up because of it. So we have to join together to secure some sites for um, workforce housing. So um, thanks to everyone who was here. Thanks to our panelists. And again, encouraging you to think through what are the resources that you want to pr preserve in perpetuity in your community. Hold them in some sort of permanent trust and figure out uh, fair ways to allocate. It's your job to do. You can do it without government solutions. And uh, some examples were here. There are others in the room. So thank you very much.